I am pleased to welcome you all to the fourth annual Chicago International Education Conference. The development and organization of the International Education Conference is a collaborative effort of the Chicago Public Schools Office of Language and Cultural Education, Chicago Sister Cities International, and the Center for International Studies. On behalf of all of the conference organizers, I would like to recognize the co-sponsors of this conference and thank them for their generous support. The University of Chicago's Office of Civic Engagement, the Neighborhood Schools Program, and the International House. Thank you also to the organizations that will be speaking this afternoon about their programs. These are programs that can help you to internationalize your curriculum. We thank all of them for their time and their resources that they will be providing this afternoon. We are fortunate to have with us representatives from Chicago Sister Cities International, the Fulbright Alumni Association, Chicago Chapter, United Nations Association of the United States of America's Global Classrooms, Model UN, the University of Chicago's International and Area Study Centers, the Smart Museum and the Neighborhood Schools Program, and the American Red Cross. It is now my pleasure to welcome up to the podium Sonia Malunda, Senior Associate Vice President for Community Engagement at the University of Chicago to provide some welcoming remarks. Sonia. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each of you to the University of Chicago uh, this morning and really thank you for participating in today's meeting. We are so delighted to have you as our partners on campus. Earlier this week, I was able to participate in a couple of community events, the groundbreaking of Harper Court, which is a commercial retail development on 53rd Street in our community, as well as our, as well as our community reception last evening. And as President Zimmer stated in both of those events, the strength of this university is our partnership with you, the partnership with all of the organizations that are represented here. And it is what we would like to do more of as a university. We haven't always been the best partner, but we are making every effort today to put partnership first. And so we appreciate the partnership with the city, with the sister agency, the Chicago Public Schools, and the partnership with you, your classrooms, your young people that you're teaching. So we would like to welcome you back to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. Please don't be a stranger to the, to the campus. Visit us, bring your young people to the campus. We have a lot of public lectures and resources, free resources that are available to you as a community. And we would like to do more as an institution to welcome you and to be a resource to you, your schools, your parents, and your young people. I would be remiss if I didn't say a few thank yous uh, to all of the organizers for today's meeting. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Jamie Bender and her office, as well as Shaz Razul, who is a member of my team in the Office of Civic Engagement. You will learn more this afternoon about the Neighborhood Schools Program, which Shaz runs. This is our effort to connect university students, hundreds of them, to area schools, working as teaching assistants, mentors, tutors, in our local public schools. So again, thank you, welcome, and please come back. Danya Khazan is the Senior Manager of International Programs and Educational Initiatives at Chicago Sister Cities International. She has helped lead efforts for the International Education Conference for the last four years and for the Sister Cities Education Conference even one year before that. Chicago Sister Cities International has been an invaluable partner in the International Education Conference. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Danya Khazan. Thank you, Jamie. Well, good morning again. Um, welcome on behalf of Chicago Sister Cities International. We're thrilled to be here for the fourth straight year. 
co-hosting this conference with Chicago Public Schools, the Center for International Studies, the University of Chicago, and International House. This building is a special place, and I'm so pleased to be here yet again. I would like to thank our session leaders, guest speakers, and presenters for coming together today for our common goal in international education. And I also would like to put a special thank you for Gregory Smith, who I saw this morning, who's actually the genius mind from when this conference started uh, four years ago or five years ago now for the Sister Schools Abroad Conference, and I'm thrilled to see how much it's grown till today. I would especially like to thank Ellen Estrada, who has been a pioneer in global education in Chicago. She has beautifully incorporated sister school partnerships abroad to Walter Payton College Prep and is a great example of what one can achieve when you have a vision. Thank you, Ellen, for being here today. Our goal for this conference is to share with you, the teachers, uh, tools to take our Sister Schools Abroad program to a new level by utilizing global competences in your classrooms. We hope you will think about how to incorporate schools in our 28 sister cities abroad around the world into your lessons, and we hope that you use their experiences and perspectives to help enrich the global education of our youth in Chicago and share some of Chicago with the world. I look forward to seeing some of you in the afternoon session for the Sister Schools Abroad. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy your day. Thank you, Dania. So as I mentioned, the Office of Language and Cultural Education is the third partner in organizing the annual International Education Conference. Amy Hammerin, Manager of World Languages and International Studies, sends her regrets for not being able to be with us today. She is leading an Arabic teacher workshop and simply could not be in two places at once. Um, I too would like to recognize Gregory Smith. Uh, Gregory, like Dania, has been one of the primary planners of this conference since the beginning. Every year it has been Gregory that started thinking about the conference six months in advance and got us planning. It was his idea to make the theme of this year's conference, Educating for Global Competence. So at the risk of embarrassing him, Gregory, would you stand up? Um, join me in recognizing Gregory's dedication and hard work. Thank you. Our conference today will focus on the concept of educating for global competence. As educators and education stakeholders, we have a responsibility to prepare our students for the world they live in, to teach them how to think critically, and to be globally aware. Whether we are teaching our students about the connection between where the parts in their cell phones come from and the exploitation of mineral resources mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or teaching about the effect of increased carbon emissions by only a handful of countries, causing the accelerating melting of glaciers in the Himalayas, and thus leading to water shortages for hundreds of millions of people. It is increasingly clear that our students must understand that what happens in one part of the world is very likely affecting people in other areas of the world. With the development of new technologies like video chat, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we are more interconnected than ever. Our students must know what is going on around the world, understand those issues, and be willing to investigate those issues of global significance. As the authors of the book you received today eloquently lay out, this demands interdisciplinary thinking through investigating the world, being able to recognize multiple perspectives, having the ability to communicate views effectively, and being willing to take action. These are the four core capacities associated with global competence. It is our hope that by the end of the day today, the following outcomes will be achieved. One, that participants will be able to recognize global competences. Two, teachers will leave with one idea about integrating global competences, global competences into a specific unit or lesson, including an assessment of their own needs for actually planning and implementing that lesson and unit. Three, participants will be able to identify different ways that a lesson might incorporate global competences. Four, participants will be able to identify aspects of a given lesson that address global competences. Five, participants will learn about resources and support available from organizations that can assist in integrating global competences into a curriculum. 
And finally, six, participants will interact with other teachers who are trying to implement global competences and have the option to keep in contact with those colleagues to enhance professional development in the area of global education. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Ellen Estrada. Ellen Estrada is a leadership coach and the former principal of Walter Payton Prep. Saying that she is a strong advocate for educating for global competence is an understatement. This work is her passion. She has already helped change the teaching practice of numerous educators and thus opened the eyes of hundreds and hundreds of students to new global perspectives. She is one of the EdSteps Global Competence Task Force members that had a hand in developing the book you received today, Educating for Global Competence, Preparing Our Youth to Engage the World. Please join me in welcoming Ellen Estrada. Well, good morning. <laughs> um, this is a, it's great to see everyone here today and to know that. I, I really feel like we're gonna be preaching to the choir today because I think you all know how important it is to teach young people about the world and how they need to uh, understand the world and interact in the world. Um, today, um, we're, we will be um, looking at the book that is in front of you and I uh, hope that we can rough up some of the pages together um, and so this is one of these conferences where you're actually going to be doing some hands-on work in the breakout sessions. We're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, with me today is someone who um, represents an organization that was very instrumental in my development as a global educator. Um, I began my educational career um, in Wisconsin working for the Department of Public Instruction and um, traveling into the migrant camps and signing up students who uh, were uh, needed to be assigned to different school districts in Wisconsin. So I traveled from the onion fields in the north part of the state to the mint fields near Lake Mills and uh, signed up students and talked with superintendents uh, about their needs, etc. cetera. Um, I also traveled to uh, Mexico, Central and South America and spent a year at uh, the university uh, in Valparaiso in Chile. Um, so I, had, I always had a desire to know the world and to, and to figure out um, what the world was like and how it was different from me and how it was the same as me. And, and I think that that's a disposition that some people have and I think it's a disposition we can teach. And one of the people who's been very, very uh, involved in doing this uh, is Brandon Wiley. Uh, and I'm going to introduce him to you now. Um, he is uh, the executive director of the um, uh, International Study Schools Network. Uh, a network of schools that uh, focus on international studies here in the United States. Brandon began his career in education as an elementary and middle school teacher just outside of Buffalo, New York. And prior to his teaching in Buffalo, he taught abroad as a teacher as part of an exchange program where uh, his passion for international education emerged. Uh, that may be the case for some of you here. Since that time, Brandon has served as a staff developer, director of staff development, and a sister superintendent, assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. A little over a year ago, he assumed the role of director of Asia Society's International Study Schools Network, a network of over 30 schools nationwide committed to developing high school graduates that are globally competent and college ready. Under his leadership, the ISSN has expanded from 24 to 34 schools, further deepening Asia Society's commitment to preparing more American students to be globally competent. In his spare time, Brandon has led student delegations to over a dozen countries on humanitarian missions and is working on a doctoral studies program focusing on global education at the University of Pennsylvania. Please help me welcome Brandon Wiley. The truth is I have no spare time, so I don't know what you're referring to, and I'm sure many of you don't have any spare time either. Um, good morning, my name is Brandon Wiley, as you heard, and I'm so honored to be here, and, I'm, and actually, I, I just can't tell you, you have a certain view, I have a really awesome view, um, <laughs> to see all of you sitting here, to see so many professionals who are committed to this type of work. So this morning, I'm gonna make my remarks brief, because your day today is really about you, it's not about me. It's about you engaging in this work, talking with one another, and being able to share some strategies. Um, as Ellen so kindly uh, described, my uh, work primarily is with schools around the United States. Asia Society is a cultural institution that began in 1956 by John D. Rockefeller III. 
And our mission is about uh, trying to have a shared future between the countries of Asia and the United States. So you might ask then, well, what exactly does that mean for schools? Well, shortly after September 11th, as many people did, uh, Asia Society sort of took stock of what it was doing and what a difference it was making or not making. And so we began this mission to really promote the idea of global competence. And born from that was the ISSN. And I need my PowerPoint. And so what we've uh, done is we've created this network of schools around the United States. Primarily these are schools that we've helped school districts create from scratch. And in some cases these were existing schools that we've partnered with to help them embed an international studies approach. We are very fortunate to have two partner schools here in the Chicago Public Schools, Walter Payton College Prep, uh, as Ellen was the principal of that school, as well as the Ogden International School. Uh, but the, the point is this, you don't have to belong to a network to do this work, and that's really the message that I want to share with you this morning. Every one of you, whatever your role might be, whether it's classroom teacher, school leader, district leader, higher education, we all have a shared mission towards trying to prepare our students to be globally competent. And it begins with one, it begins with, with the individual. And so as a classroom teacher, I have a role. As a school leader, I have a role. So today I'd like to share some stories about what that might look like. So we don't have a lot of time to discuss this very important question just yet, but I think it will emerge over time. Why is it important for us to be thinking about how we can prepare our students to be globally competent and ready for college? So we're gonna try a little something here. I would love for you to be talking more than me, but I don't have a lot of time. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to turn to a partner, and in three words, only three words, I want you to try to answer this question. But I want you to focus on the globally competent part. Why is it important for our students to be globally competent in three words? Please try that. <laughs> okay, that sounded like 17 words. So I'm gonna stop you there. I think some of you are cheating. And giggling does not count as a word, I'll give you that. Okay, so from the audience, if you could just shout out a couple of those words that you just heard from you or you, or you said or that your partner heard. In the back, go ahead, sir. Interdependence. Interdependence. Someone else. Yes. Democracy. Democracy. Go ahead. We are, not alone. we are not alone. Four words, but oh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I hope you're not a math teacher. That's all I can say. Yes, sir. Be more, Be more marketable. All right, like it. World getting smaller, yes, sir. Uh, critical, problem critical problem solvers. Last one. Research, teaching, patient care. Ah, very good. So, a lot of times when I do this, one of the words that I usually hear is jobs. Yes, I think someone. Did anybody say jobs when you're talking to your partner? So, one of the things that we really want to be thinking about is the idea that our society, our economy in particular, has certainly become very global. And so the future of our economy here in the United States is very closely tied to the economies of the world. And if you're in Egypt, for example, that has gone through all the turmoil that it's gone through this year, as we go as an American economy, so too does Egypt. If our economy is tanking and our people aren't going to take those vacations to Egypt, their economy suffers. And so as much as our economy relies on other countries, in many cases the economies of other countries do even more so. So for our kids, it's an opportunity not just to be thinking about making a good living, but it's about creating opportunities. Many of you want your kids to stay here. You want them to find jobs in this community. You want them to contribute to your community. But to do that, they have to have the skills that are necessary for them to get those jobs. In fact, there's some recent studies that have been done that show that there are actually quite a few jobs here in the United States, but they're not being filled because this, the, the workforce does not have the skills necessary to fill them. So, our belief at Asia Society is that we need to help kids to become really globally competent because it is through global competence that they're able to address the varied issues that are gonna affect them in the 21st century. So, and this is gonna to be tough for you folks in the back to see what the color is, and, and I'm colorblind, so I really can't see it. But, um, so the idea here is that if you were to take the population of the world and you were gonna put it on a ratio of one to 100 to talk about the proportion of, of individuals in the world, 61 of the 100 people would be coming from Asia. The United States, we're towards the bottom, five. Now I want you to think about that for a second, just the sheer magnitude. So it's not even about the skills, it's also about the numbers, the number of people that are outperforming us just because there's more of them. So I wanna show you an example of this. 
I had an opportunity uh, a month ago to visit a school in China. One of the things that we're also looking at doing is actually expanding our network to include international schools. And at 10.15 every morning at the school, there are 5,000 students in the school. They all exit their classrooms and come out to exercise in the morning as a group. I just want you to watch this for a second. Can you get your kids to do that? Just wondering. I mean, and, and really the question is, would you want to get your kids to do that? What is the value of something like this? So I talked, oh, by the way, there were four teachers supervising that. Four, four. Okay, now, I share this with you, again, partly to scare you, okay, because I have to be honest, I stood there and I taped that and I thought, my goodness, if they can get their kids to do this, if they can get them to be of single mind, to focus on a mission. Mm. I have to also tell you that many of these kids, their goal is to come here to the United States. Their goal is to come to school mm. and our universities and our colleges and to find opportunities and jobs. Well, guess what? If they do that, that's great because they will bring a lot of talent and ingenuity to this country, but they also will be competing with our kids. And so we have to be thinking about how are we continuing to prepare our kids with the skill sets that they'll need. How about our kids going to China to get jobs? That's an interesting idea too. They need us just as much as we need them. So I share this with you today, again, not to, not to alarm you, but also to alarm you a little bit. Because the imperative of global education is not just because it's a fun thing to do. I was a social studies teacher, so this is in my wheelhouse. right? This is what I, why I wanted to be a teacher of social studies. But I have a colleague who is a teacher of math who I have this discussion with all the time about what is important about international education if I'm a math teacher. The reality is it's very important because it's preparing kids for what they'll need in the world. So there's other things that we have to be thinking about. There are issues that affect us here in Chicago, in the United States, and around the world. And to the degree that our kids are prepared to solve those solutions is really going to be critical moving forward. And we don't have to wait until they're in college. We don't have to wait until they're adults. These are issues that they can grapple with right now in elementary, middle, and high school. And I don't know about you, but it sounds like that might be actually a little more interesting. But I know you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, well, what about things like the tests? What about the standards? What about what my district is asking me to do? Our goal today is to try to show you different ways in which you can still address all of those things while rising above it to prepare your kids to be globally competent. So, uh, and you're going to hear a lot more about this, but Asia Society was engaged with CCSSO, which is a group of chief school officers from across the United States. So these are your state superintendents of schools. And they commissioned a task force to really define what this word, this term global competence means. Because I think the word global is very abstract for a lot of people. Global doesn't necessarily mean a different country. It means understanding the issues that affect a global society. And so when we talk about global competence, we had to get a little bit tighter on the definition. And so Tony Jackson, one of the co-authors of the book that you received today, who is our Vice President of Education, was the chair of this committee of researchers and experts from around the country to really define what global competence means. And so the first thing that I want you to take away is that content knowledge does matter. This is not an attempt to tell you that knowing math and knowing science and knowing it deeply isn't important. In fact, it's very important because to be able to make decisions to be able to really interpret points of view and perspectives and to be able to apply it, you have to have deep content knowledge. But it is also about the capacities to do other things. And you're gonna talk a lot about these today, so I'm not going to elaborate too much, other than to say the idea is that students have an opportunity to investigate ideas and questions of significance, that they're able to look at it from different points of view, which, by the way, begins with them understanding their point of view first before they can worry and think about the point of view of others. They have to be able to ground that in something. 
that they take that information that they've collected and that they share it to a broader audience and communicate those ideas. And then finally, if, if possible, they try to take action to make a difference both locally and globally. So today you're going to engage with these issues and thinking about in what ways as a math teacher, as a science teacher, as a teacher of rural language, do I address these four things in my classroom? So, and again, in the back, if you can't see this, I apologize. These are things that our kids in the 21st century will need to do. Selling to the world, buying from the world, working with people all over the world, solving problems. So the ultimate question is, are our kids ready for this? And I would say yes, in some cases they are very ready for this. I think we have students who are very creative, who are very, uh, very interested and curious about the world. How many of you have seen Jay Leno when he does the jaywalking episode? Have you ever seen that? Where like they ask like basic questions about geography and history. All right, I'm going to give you a little jaywalking for a second here. So uh, Asia Society conducted a research study with National Geographic, and here are a couple findings that might be a little bit troubling, a little bit like jaywalking. First, six in ten students could not find Iraq on a map. Think about the time and energy the United States has spent in that region of the world, and our kids don't know where it is. 25% of college-bound high school students did not know the name of the ocean that separates the U.S. and Asia. A little troubling. Young Americans were next to last in a nine-country survey of knowledge of current events. Are you surprised? Where do you have time to teach that in your curriculum when you're trying to cover the things that you need to cover that you've been asked to teach, really? And the last one here is most teachers are not prepared to teach about Asia. Of the top 50 colleges and universities that train teachers, just a handful require any coursework about Asian history. As a history major, I took one course. Now think back to that slide where I showed the proportions. Do you think maybe we should pay attention? Maybe. I'm not sure. This is part of the discussion. So I just want to share with you that there's also a misnomer that only certain types of students can do this work. Okay, so in our network, we have approximately now 34 schools in seven states, about 16,000 students. The majority of these schools are traditional public high schools, although we do have a couple charter and one independent school. They're primarily in urban settings. When we designed the network, it was to prepare students from minority and low-income families who did not have access to quality education previously, a quality education with a global focus. And so across our network, 63% of our students are from low-income families, and 80% are considered minority students. And yet, 93% of those students are graduating on time, and they're going on to college. So the reality is a focus on global education, regardless of who your students are, and I know I don't know your kids, but in a sense, I do know your kids, because your kids are our kids. This is possible, but it has to be with precision and with some real thought about how you're going to go about this. So I'm going to skip ahead here and give you just a couple things that I'm going to finish on. First, I think there are things that you as an individual teacher can do and need to think about. The first is this idea that we need to think about how can we create professional learning communities to focus on this. You today, my friends, are a professional learning community. You're here for a reason. And I hope it's not because the other offerings today were just not so much exciting to you. I hope this is something you're really passionate about. And so the reality is you are now part of this network. So we have a network of schools, but you now, in essence, are a network as well. You can leave here today with opportunities, with friendships, with projects, and I hope you will. I'm challenging you to. So as a network, uh, you know, there's a lot of different tools that you can use technology-wise about what, what a network is, but you can just do it face-to-face. -face. Uh, we as a network use uh, something called Ning, and we have a Ning that we use so all of our schools can communicate and they can share ideas. Uh, today, how many of you use Twitter? Okay, about a third of you. Okay, so for those of you, raise your hand high again if you're a Twitter. Now, for those of you who don't tweet, look around the room. My challenge to you today is to find someone who tweets and have them try to teach you. Because there's going to be a contest. I'm going to challenge this audience. We'll see. You told me this was the overachiever group, but we'll see. So here's the thing. For those of you who, are, who use tw uh, Twitter, we created a hashtag for you today, and it's on your agenda. And the hashtag is hashtag IEC2011. And for those of you who don't know what that means, don't worry about it. <laughs> no, really worry about it, because I have prizes that I want to give out today. So we're hoping that people today will tweet about your learning. What are the things you're learning? What are the things you're hearing? What are your big takeaways? This is a way to network and to share. By the way, your kids are doing this even when you don't want them to. 
So for those of us who don't know this, I mean this very lovingly, you need to figure it out. All those networks, you need to figure it out because this is the mode in which our kids are learning and we need to be out in front when we can. So the first thing is, again, developing these professional learning communities. The next is thinking about targeting your curriculum. So, you know, I have some people say, well, Brandon, my school is talking a lot about Common Core, right? Any of you, right? You've maybe heard of that. If not, welcome. Um, so, so Common Core, yeah, absolutely, you have to deal with that. But we have common assessments we have to give. We are being evaluated by the district. Yes, yes, and yes. So be strategic. So if I think about my curriculum from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, my whole year does not have to be international. Not every single activity, not every single project is going to have this focus. But I need to think systematically about when and where are the topics that I can teach that I can go a little bit deeper, that I can embed project-based learning, an interdisciplinary opportunity for students to really engage in content more deeply. To try to do it all, my friends, is overwhelming, so don't do it. And I hit the wrong button, Jamie. So another thing I want you to think about, and I'm going to finish on these two slides. The first is, uh, when we're coaching our teachers and getting them to think a little bit about their curriculum, we ask them to think about these four things. When and where in your curriculum do you give students the opportunity for choice? So particularly if it's projects or there's certain learning outcomes that there's opportunities for them to make choices, when and where do you give them those choices? Second, is what you're asking them to do authentic? Is it something that adults do in the real world? Now, I don't know about any of you, but I haven't made a diorama for my job anytime soon, nor have I made a poster for that matter. So the reality is, how can we engage them in things that actual adults do? Global. Are the things we're teaching, can we make a global connection? And again, it doesn't have to be about a country in another world. It could be about your community. Your community is global. And then lastly, how are they, uh, how are they exhibiting this work? If the audience is always you, the teacher, we wonder why kids aren't motivated. The reality is there has to be a purpose beyond just this test or this day. So this is just one strategy that we use when we're working with some of our teachers. And the last two things I would say is connect your classroom with cultural and educational institutions. This afternoon you have a really unique opportunity and I'm really impressed with the, the quality of the groups that you have this afternoon to connect with. They have resources, my guess is many of them are free, if they're not they should be. Uh, free stuff that you can connect with, projects, asiasociety.org is our website. We have a whole bunch of free resources for teachers there. We encourage you to go there. And lastly, we hope that you will develop your global competence. How many of you have traveled outside of the United States? Awesome. See. Now, Twitter, I'll get by. I'll, I'm okay with that. That one I would have been a little less understanding of. So here's my point. You don't have to leave the country to be globally competent. I've been blessed, as, as was mentioned, to travel with students. Uh, this is me in Egypt, Costa Rica, and Morocco. Now, notice, I'm not rich because I'm wearing the same shirt in all three pictures. <laughs> so clearly, you don't have to be rich. You, don't, you just can't have a you know, big wardrobe, that's all. But my point is, through learning as a teacher and by traveling, it has not only expanded my horizons, but it's better prepared me to have these conversations with students and to try to encourage them to take these same adventures in life. I grew up in a single family home where my mom didn't have money. There's no way, as a, as a high school student, we would have been able to afford to do these trips. So we have to find ways to bring the world to our kids. Uh, and I'm gonna skip that, and I'm gonna skip that, and I'm just gonna say we have an annual conference consider coming. It's in, Wash it's in New York this year, uh, where we have teachers from all over the, the world that uh, come together and collaborate. And uh, if you have any questions at all, I'm only an email away. And I wish you much luck. This is important work you're doing every day. And, and I have to tell you that the hardest decision I ever made was leaving the classroom. I envy you and I thank you. Have a great day. Um, thank you, everyone, who made this uh, conference possible. And I think what I'd like to do at this point is to just kind of go over what we're going to be doing the next hour together here. Um, we will touch on the impact of globalization and kind of uh, talk a little bit about what Brandon talked about. And of course, we know that as educators, we have to say things three times before um, students uh, actually are hearing what we're saying. Um, we, and you will be talking about that at with trios at your table. Uh, we will review the global competences. 
uh, and we're going to connect the global competencies with the common core standards. How many of you are from schools that are early adopters? Any early adopter schools here? Okay, so a few. Okay, and, but all, all of your ILTs and your principals have been going to uh, pr professional development training on common core standards in English language arts and uh, mathematics. Uh, there's some, been some decisions made about what professional development will look like around the common cores, but I want to uh, talk about that and how the global competencies really integrate with that. We'll unpack the competencies a little bit. We're going to look at two videos through the lens of global competencies, and we'll share some thoughts at your table. And again, we're going to rough up the pages of your new book. Um, the references for my presentation, I always like to let uh, give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, the book here was written by Tony Jackson and Veronica. Veronica is, is head of pro, uh, Project Zero at Harvard Graduate School of Education. You can see her little bio in the back of the book. Tony Jackson is the Executive Director of Education for Asia Society. And I worked on the task force that helped develop global competencies, uh, and they took our information and created this book from it. Five Minds of the Future by Howard Gardner, uh, The Global Achievement Gap by Tony Wagner, and Shift Age and Shift Ed, uh, two new books that have come out from David Hoyle. And I think some, you know, um, as we think about global competencies and think about the world, I, I think that uh, if we think about children and what they want from us as adults. I was at Hurricane High School in Hurricane, West Virginia a few years back, um, talking with some teachers. And it's interesting, West Virginia has adopted global education standards for the state, you wouldn't think that West Virginia would be one of those states who would be that progressive, but think about their position now in the global economy and their, their whole economic basis being coal. They've had to really change. They've had to totally reinvent themselves in the global economy. And so the education state superintendent was quite progressive and said, we need to really think about how we're going to um, develop our students around this. So I was at Hurricane High School, and, and I, at every place we go to, I know when we go to every school, first thing we do is look at the art that's on the wall. We look at what students are producing and what's on the wall. And there was this great piece of a, of a child looking up at an adult, and um, underneath it said, children ask the world of us. And so, you know, my question is like, what world will we give them? And if we just give them their neighborhood, if we just give them their neighborhood school, if we just give them their community, whether it be Saginaw or Englewood, will they become entrenched in the small world that exists around them? And it could be filled with prejudice, injustice, dangers, and just, well, not very many choices at all. So I think we have to give them the world. I think the whole world allows them to be curious, as they investigate and explore and be reflective and courageous as they analyze multiple perspectives and communicate to a variety of audiences and be transformative as they take action on our global earth. So getting back to giving um, our children the world, what does the world look like now in the second decade of the 21st century? <clears throat> I have a really bad cold, so pardon me here. So, um, oops, let me go back here. So, um, as we look at the impact of globalization on education, let's look at the demographics and the economics. There are now more than six billion people in the world, and that fact alone is enough for us to consider how we might want to reorganize human efforts and resources in a global perspective. Six billion people. Um, we are still living the way we did when there were far fewer people in the world. Our American economy rests on many shores, not just the east and west coast. Multinationals are doing business on every continent and in nearly every language. Money, think about money. Money has now lost, it's totally lost its physical characteristic. Money transfers can occur at any moment and move from one currency to another um, momentarily. And the economy leads the way for more cultural and political changes. There's been a dramatic flow to global, as David Howell writes in his book, The Shift Age. And at the same time, there's been a flow to the individual. Social organizations have moved from hierarchies 
to networks. We've seen that here in Chicago. Now we're talking more about networks all the time. Um, the drive towards centralization in the industrial age began to disintegrate in the information age with the advances in technology. And vertical hierarchies flattened into horizontal networks and individuals are now able to circumvent, go, you know, just go around the established social structures and connect around common interests regardless of location or status. In 1995, people worked up the corporate ladder and socialized at private clubs. In 2005, people worked as independent contractors on the internet or entrepreneurs on the internet, connecting on social networks like MySpace and now Facebook. The Eastern and Western Bloc no longer exist. The disintegration of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Berlin Wall demonstrate a change in the political scene. In 1985, communism was perceived as a plausible economic and political order. By 2005, it was essentially dead as a viable way of governance. By 2005, the largest communist country in the world, China, had become the fastest growing capitalist country in the world. So what defines our... Um, Hold on, okay, let's do this now. Okay, at your, at, your, at your tables, from your perspective, what are the societal and environmental transformations we see in a globalized world affecting your students' lives today? And how will they be affected in the future? I'm gonna give you um, a, a five minutes to talk about this. So let's talk about how all of this really is affecting your students. Okay, so five minutes. Thanks. I have some under here too. Thanks, I appreciate it, yeah. Okay, let's uh, wrap it up with your last thought, please. And I bet it was a little difficult to talk about what, um, how, how these, uh, how globalization will affect education in our students' lives in the future, because we really don't necessarily know what it, what it looks like. Save those thoughts for your breakout sessions today as you start to think about um, some great ideas for your lessons. <clears throat> so let's talk about what some of the research says around this. Uh, in Howard Gardner's book, Five Minds of the Future, anyone read that book here? Besides uh, our, our patent? Okay, that, that's not my hearing aid. Okay, so. But I do get some um, very interesting sound waves from um, other global areas sometimes. Do we know what that is? Honestly, I don't know what that is. So I'm gonna keep on talking, okay? All right, so, um, oh, I know what it is. Okay, got it, all right. That was my hearing aid, okay, so. All right, so from the researchers, we have uh, Howard Gardner's Five Minds of the Future. And uh, Gardner, of course, the, in, uh, the, the, the professor at Harvard who talked about multiple intelligences, is really concerned about how we're preparing our students for uh, the future and whether we're preparing uh, our young people to be uh, ethical, uh, respectful individuals in a globalized society. So he talked about the need for folks to really demonstrate characteristics of a disciplined mind. And of course, that gets back to what Brandon was talking about, is that there needs to be deep content um, in, in what we're teaching our students. We can't leave that aside. This can't be superficial. This, they, students need to understand um, a, a discipline, at least one discipline very well, um, and to, to really be, to, a, a, to be able to engage and thrive in the world. A synthesizing mind, a creating mind, a respectful mind and an eth ethical mind. His book's very interesting as he develops these things. And as you, as you see us talk more about the global competencies and how it's integrated with Common Core, you'll see how all this plays out. He's also written about the healthy mind, and certainly wellness is a big issue right now in our schools. We, we live in a society where obesity is, is a, a real disease. Uh, the relationship mind and the emotional mind. So that's from, that's from um, uh, Gardner. Um, Tony Wagner's book, uh, The Global Achievement Gap, people have read that. Um, he, he identifies seven survival skills for careers, college, and citizenship in the 21st century. And let's look at them here. 
We're gonna see them again reiterated in the global competencies and also in the common core standards. Critical thinking, um, collaboration across networks, leading by influence. You know, this is, this is uh, nurturing leadership in young people is so important and having them understand that they can influence situations positively without having a position of, of power is really a great uh, skill to teach them, a great disposition to have. Agility and adaptability in their thinking. We know that whatever we're, whatever's happening in the future is going to be coming quickly and um, intensely. And we do not like change, do we? So being able to teach students uh, this agility and adapt um, adaptability is really important. Initiative and entrepreneurship. Now this is why those Chinese students want to come to the United States, is because here in the United States, our innovation, our creativity, our innovation still is what pushes our economy forward. Um, so that, that's so important for us to really be able to continue to work on. Effective oral and written communications. Now Wagner doesn't say that they should be able to, to be able to communicate in different languages or with different media, but certainly the global competencies will. Curiosity and imagination, so important to foster and nurture in our students here. So um, that's what the researchers are talking to us, talking to us about. <clears throat> and what defines our new era? Well, if we think of the agricultural age, and of course Tony Wagner's whole premise is that our schools were built for the agricultural age. Our school calendar was built for the agricultural age, um, and that our um, our schools were built for the industrial age, and most of our schools actually passed through the information age without really receiving the level of technology they needed to even begin to embrace the information age. But now that we're really um, moving out of the information age into a new age, and consciousness will really be an important part of that. So global competence, <clears throat> Um, is the knowledge, skills, and disposition, and I love this word disposition, to understand and act creatively and innovatively on issues of global significance. Global, globally significant issues are worldwide in scope, important or important local issues that are faced by others in the world. So we can, we can start thinking about um, uh, how even something that happens uh, somewhere around the world is affecting people here. Uh, especially with human migration. So here are some examples of such issues. Environmental sustainability, population growth, economic development, global conflict and cooperation, health and human development. I know that health was, um, was talked about a little bit ago. Human rights and cultural identity and diversity. I mean, our, our, um, our world has changed so much in terms of who makes up our cities uh, and where people are located. So the competencies um, are, are these. And if you want to follow me in the book, I, I, let's, let's take a look at the book right now. Okay. So in your book, the competencies are in the back <clears throat> on page 102. And you have little post-its to kind of tab those pages a little bit because I will ask you to go through these pages. ahead and put a little tab there. Okay, so um, as you look at the book, Page 102 has what we call the mother matrix. And uh, next to it are the content area matrices. So the next page is the matrix for the arts. Following is English language arts, math, science, social studies, and world languages are all included. So as we developed the competencies, um, we, we thought about each of the content areas and what would be important to add 
you, that would be unique in that content area. But the mother matrix is really what we're talking about uh, in this presentation. And as you go into your breakout sessions, you can talk more um, about that as well. <clears throat> so the competencies are investigate the world. And again, we're moving the students outside of their immediate environment. We're not just talking about their neighborhood. We're not just talking about their city. We're not just talking about their state or their nation. We're really moving them into um, a global environment. And you know, some people, you know, as we were talking about this in the task force, we said, well, this might be like the new civics. This might be like, you know, when's the last time we taught civics in the schools, right? Quite, quite a long time ago. But now people have to be global citizens. They have to understand how their life can impact the entire world or how their world is impacted by things that are happening in different places. Um, we want students to be able to uh, recognize their own and others' perspectives. And holding on, understanding your own perspective is really uh, an important piece of this because I think you'll see in the Common Core Standards that they do want students to be able to understand other perspectives, but for students to be able to recognize where their own perspective comes from and why they're holding on to certain assumptions is really important. So to clear, as, as educators, to clarify those assumptions for them would be an important part of, of your lesson, an important part of the activities. Communicating their ideas effectively and with diverse audiences. So, so and, and of course, we're talking about now integrating uh, numerous types of technologies, social media, into this um, as well. Think about, um, think about when ho the hostages were taken in Tehran, Iran, in 1980, I believe it was. And we knew nothing about what was happening there. We knew nothing, we had no news coming out of that country at all. We, our intelligence was poor um, and everything was locked down. Think about the recent um, protests in Tehran that began with a single tweet and the use of social media and how we were able to see what was happening in those protests. Think about that in Egypt or in the other countries that now have been um, undergoing such immense changes. The ability to communicate immediately um, has really changed um, our ability to know what's happening in these countries. And we can teach about it immediately. And of course, the last one was translating their ideas and findings into appropriate actions to improve conditions. And the whole piece um, about taking action in the book, in the Matrix, was something we discussed considerably. You know, was it our job or is it our job as educators to teach students to take action? Well, the truth is, is that our students want to take action. In fact, things make sense to them when they do something. You know, we keep saying that um, uh, if you hear something, you learn a certain percent of it, uh, if you see it or whatever. So if you do it, it's so much more profound for students. And taking action has them make sense of what they're doing in the classroom. Um, and the truth is we have been asking students to take action around many different things historically. Now we're being more uh, deliberate about having them take action around global issues. So as you think about what students might be doing, the, resulted, the resulting work from your lessons on global competencies, and by the way, you know, this is not an attempt to have you teach all four competencies at once. While that would be great, thinking about teaching one of the competencies, investigating the world, for example, we're gonna see a little video about, video about that later. Um, just uh, teaching one of the competencies or, or two of the competencies together is great as well. So, um, so as you think about the activities and tasks and then also what do you want the, the student work to look like at the end? So it could be, um, Take a variety of forms, be a written document, multimedia work, or an, an art <clears throat> or design. Now, the actual task force that developed the global competencies worked with CCSSO, which Brandon explained is the chief, uh, the, ch the Council of Chief State School Officers. It's the professional organization for all of the state superintendents of education, all 50 of them. 
they meet together and they talk about what do we need to do in our states for education? Because as you know, in the Constitution, there is no national curriculum. The states decide what to do. So as these common core standards are, are being developed, um, each state is taking a look at that and determining what they want to do at the state level with those standards. At the same time that the English and language arts and math common core standards were being developed, global competencies uh, standards were being developed in the same office in Washington, and the math met down the hall and English met across the hall from us when we were meeting. And we really wanted to um, really create something a little unique so that we could give teachers uh, a, real, a public library to go into to look at um, lesson plans, ideas, uh, resources, et cetera, um, uh, that would provide them um, with great opportunities to create their lessons. The other um, pieces that are being worked on, as well as global competencies, are creative, creativity, problem solving, and analyzing information. So were you to go to the website where the global competencies are housed, um, uh, edsteps.org, you would also see these areas of development as well, creativity, problem solving, and analyzing information. These are very difficult and costly to develop and assess in districts. So uh, there are other task forces that were working on this at the same time that we were working on global competencies. And it's very interesting to go in and kind of combine the two as well. Writing is another one that is there as well. And that, that actually involves students. They involve students in that. So that was, that was great. So this is what the, the website looks like. <clears throat> and here's, <clears throat> here's actually the, the online piece for the matrix, scenarios, and here's information about the initiative, and the content area matrices are all there, and there are additional resources that are at the end, end of my presentation, but they're, they're from the online piece here where we put them all together. So let's... Let's talk about a little bit about one, one area of globalization. And that's the um, example of human migration. So by the summer of 2010, the total number of migrants in the world will have been 214 million. Those are people leaving their countries and going to live somewhere else. We have some of those students in our classrooms, don't we? 50 million are estimated to be living in the United States. And if all migrants were considered one country, it would be the fourth largest country in the world in population after China, India, and the United States. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? There has not been this level of migration or, or movement of people in the world ever historically. So why do we teach about human migration? Oops, I did that. I did it wrong too, right? Push the wrong button. Well, um, it's happening now, and it's affecting elements of our political, social, and cultural national agendas. And things are moving quickly because of migration. In 2008, this migrant population was responsible for $338 billion of remittances back to their countries of origins. And they were actually in, in, included in the growth of a country's gross de, um, domestic product. So that means that $338 billion were sent back to these countries. And it's really interesting to look at what happens to the political and social scene in these countries when this money comes back. It really, it can stabilize or destabilize local governments there. And our students are involved in, in these um, activities. Our migrant students, our immigrant students are involved and their families are involved in, in carrying out these uh, development of remittances to their countries. And um, so their lives are directly uh, affected by this process. Um, cities all over Latin America, for example, are all affected by this. 
and these global events can both promote and impede development in these countries. So just that one, just looking at migration and looking at what happens there, you can see, you can under, begin to understand some of the things that are happening globally in different parts of the world and why, why political uh, parties or governments or social structures are either becoming more stable or unstable even through that, that lens. Okay, this is actually something from um, Jeff Finelli, who's here in the uh, room here. Jeff, raise your hand in the back there. Jeff will be leading one of the uh, breakout sessions today. So after discussing and debating the riots and protests that have been occurring in North Africa, one of my students asked if this would ever be in a textbook. I answered yes, but probably not for another five years. We have to use what is happening in the world now to influence our students to make changes now, to understand what's happening in the world now. So I think that's, that's really critical. So what does teaching global competence look like? So competences, global competences are not a set of skills. You will be able to divide um, three-digit numbers. That's not what global competences are. They are um, a combination of skill sets and knowledge that can be used in an agile and flexible manner to investigate issues in the world and problem solve. So, and, and I want people to understand, um, I know that there's so many changes going on in the, um, in the district right now, and people are being asked to do a lot of things. And for those schools that are early adopters, you're being asked to start to create lesson plans with common cores. And if you're not, your ILT and your principal are, are developing professional development for you for that. So um, this is not something to add on to the Common Cores. It's something to integrate with Common Cores and to really help you with those strategies. Um, I, I think the, one of the main things to talk about is the fact that this is very interdisciplinary. And the idea, the idea is to really uh, produce uh, deeply engaging lessons for students because you're offering them such important issues to talk about. So enduring learnings, I like this idea because, it, and I'm borrowing it from the Chicago Public Schools Department of Social Studies. Anyone here from Social Studies? All right, okay, thank you so much. And I, ho I, I hope it's not copyrighted, but um, I put it in here. But I love the idea of enduring learnings because it really talks about what true learning is. And, and I think that as we develop our, our, our ability to integrate global competencies, we want to look at true learning characteristics. So um, true learners really have purpose and relevance to their learning experience. So it means something to them. So the idea uh, that Brandon brought up earlier about student choice is important as you think about developing your lessons. And again, I love that idea of dispositions. And this information comes from a lot of research on critical thinking skills, uh, intellect, intellectual integrity, that students are able to credit people um, who deserve credit for the work that they're researching and not take it on as their own, but really understand what their role is in developing knowledge uh, for their classmates and, and in their lessons that they're um, working on. Fairness and accuracy with, with information. Perseverance, that's a tough one for us to really work with our students on, isn't it? So, so is, don't you think that perseverance would be a lot easier to develop in a student when they've had a choice and they're working on an issue that has meaning to them, especially our immigrant students when they're talking about something that might be happening in their home country? Important. Empathy, how do we even, how do we even assess that? These are important issues to think about as you're creating your, les your lessons. And, and true learners have confidence in their reasoning process. They know that they've gone through the steps to really work something out um, critically. And true learners write with purpose and their own voice. And I think writing is such an important piece and it will be definitely with Common Core as we move forward. So teachers would be crafting learning goals that capture important knowledge and skills in one of the more disciplines, so that's what you'll be doing in the breakout sessions today, and crafting those learning tasks and activities that focus on relevant global competencies. And involve your students in this. Help them, you know, ask them what, they, what they'd like to be working with. And all the goals all along the way should be clearly shared with your students. I think that's what's really, really important. 
Um, and students, let's look at um, something in your book right now. Um, this refers to a couple pages. This refers to page 72 and the following pages. As you are working on developing your um, lessons for global competence, it's just a little checklist that would help you um, identify if you've selected the correct goal or outcomes, the correct topic. And then as you turn the page to 70, uh, I'm sorry, that was 71. As you turn the page to 72, here are some real great example performances uh, for each of the competencies. The first one being investigate the world. Just some really great ideas, just some brainstormed ideas that have been collected from um, successful classrooms on this issue. And one of the most, most important things is that you're engaging the whole student in this process, not just cognitively, but socially and emotionally, and that students recognize how their ideas and their thoughts and their feelings change through these um, tasks and activities around global competence. In other words, how, what, not only understanding what they've learned, but how have, they, how have they changed? That's the transformative piece. All right, so um, on page 55 in your book, and I'm having you go through these <laughs> deliberately so that you will know where to go and, and tab these again. Take your little post-its and tab them. So this, this uh, circle, which talks about how to begin to develop teaching for global competences, shows how it informs uh, each of the areas, informs each other as you move through the cycle. And again, that piece is on page 70. One, I believe, I think I put 72, I think it's 71, for your checklist. But that is how they're, that is how they're linked together. Okay, so I'm bringing up Common Core only because I don't want people to be fearful of adding new things to their curriculum and then being told that they have to add Common Core um, soon. So what I wanted to do in, in these next slides is to show you exactly inside the language that has been developed by um, the Common Core standards um, information, how these directly speak to global competencies and how you're able to integrate them with, with these, uh, the, GCs, the global competencies, with the CCSs. I guess those are our acronyms now, okay? The Common Core CCSs. So in language arts and literacy, in history, social studies, and technical subjects, um, these dispositions um, are part of the language of Common Core. This is directly in their definition. And can you see how that integrates with the global competencies. Can you see how that's very similar? Especially, you know, they respond to the varying demands of audience, task, purpose, and discipline. They comprehend as well as critique. They value evidence. 
they, in the last one, they come to understand other perspectives and cultures. Actually, while, we were, while they were creating this particular uh, standard for um, the English Common Cores, we asked them to add in there to understand their own perspective. That was not added. But as, as a globally competent educator, you definitely want to add that students need to understand their own perspective as they look at others. Um, all right, on page 102, investigate the world. In the Common Core standards itself, um, seven and eight, standards seven and eight, speak to really, I think, I, what I tried to do was pull out some things and one of the people in, on our task force um, in Washington wrote a great piece on this. Um, so in, on page 102, Investigate the World, um, these are right out of the um, Common Core Standards uh, language, the literature, to conduct short as well as more sustained research projects based on focused questions and demonstrating understanding of the subject under investigation. So can you think of how global competencies could help develop lessons to meet that standard for students. Number eight, gather relevant information from multiple print and digital sources, assess the credibility and accuracy of each source, and integrate the information while avoiding plagiarism. So there's, again, could you think of how global competencies would allow students to take a global issue and move into investigating the world? And I know that many of you um, already do this uh, in your classrooms. I think that here we have those teachers who are really interested in developing your craft at um, teaching more about the world. We have a huge number of world language teachers here today. And um, it's something that you do um, uh, on a daily basis. And um, so what we want to do is kind of shift you a little bit to look at um, how to include a little bit more deeper culture in some of your activities. Here we have an example from the Common Core Standards in Mathematical Practice. And it's something that as you look at the, common, the global competencies for math, match, it's reiterated, it's integrated, All right, recognizing perspectives. Um, again, here's a, um, the, and that is our third global competence, if you're looking on page 102, from the mother matrix there, recognizing perspectives. And again, right out of the common core, students must appreciate that the 21st century classroom and workplace are settings in which people from often widely divergent cultures and who represent diverse experiences and perspectives must learn and work together. Students actively seek to understand other perspectives and cultures through reading and listening and are able to communicate effectively with people of varied, varied backgrounds. And right out of the GCs, students will be able to explain how, how cultural interactions influence situations, events, issues, and phenomenon. This takes it a little bit farther. And again, there was conversation about whether or not that should be in the common core or not. It definitely is in the, in the global competencies. So that's our, the, our third, and let's take a look at um, a little video. And I want you to think about, um, I, I, did, I did mention that our, uh, we have a lot of world language teachers here. And, and part of the um, goal of teaching the world language is to really teach about the culture of that co the countries that speak that language. And so you, we talk a lot about food, we talk a lot about festivals, we talk about fashion, so those, those Fs there. And, and it's about what they eat, how they dress, and um, uh, how they have fun. So I, I, wanna, I want to kind of shift you a little bit and think about how food is used in this situation. Because this video presents a larger context. Food, food is always great, right? Food is, we always need food. <laughs> it's one of the most social things we can do. We always need food. But just think about how this is used in a different, in a different direction here.
the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Um, it was pretty scary to start looking at uh, CNN Chile and CNN uh, here and, and getting all this news and all this uh, live uh, forecast. Um, of, of what was going on, and the images were shocking. It was the morning of February 27th, I was uh, sleeping, and I got a phone call from my friend, uh, from my Chilean friend, who's also standing here, and she says, did you know there was an earthquake in Chile? And I was, wow, so we hang up, and I immediately try to call my parents, and so I kept the whole morning trying to call my parents, who were not, they, they were away from their hometown, and uh, that was impossible. I called them during the whole day and um, couldn't, couldn't connect with them. And so I started thinking of other ways to get some information about what, what was going on in Chile. And so Facebook actually helped me a lot because uh, people were, were beginning to, to, to post what was going on in, in Facebook. So I contacted the husband of one of my cousins, who's of one of my cousins who is American and lives in Chile and he was sending messages to all of his friends and through him I knew that everybody was okay in the family and especially my grandma which I was especially um, concerned about. The second day we like I realized we needed to do something to help and I was thinking well, this, is, this is so bad that all the people that I, that I know have helped so much uh, in the recent Haiti earthquake, right? So it's like, we're, I mean, after that great disaster, I don't know if we're gonna get much attention. And so we wanted to get to the personal level and, and for that we, we thought that we we're gonna do it like the Chilean way, which is about uh, contacting people personally and sharing. And we thought um, a nice way to do that was to share a, like a very typical meal that is uh, Chilean empanadas. These are the empanadas. This I have to give credit for, to Maria Paz who invented this idea and uh, this is a typical Chilean dish and we gave uh, like 300 empanadas to people that, in that day in the event so if you want to take a look. They're pretty tasty. It's basically a dough filled, I mean folded and uh, with a filling and gets uh, fried or, or baked depending on the case. So. A lot of people came, uh, and it's amazing how the the Haxi community in, in general, the people here, are very um, generous in terms of of helping others. And, and we we felt, and we've always felt from the beginning that uh, there's a lot of support for students like us in this in this moments, and uh, that people really care. So at the end of the day, you really realize how, how much you're con connected to your home country, even if you are far away. But on the other side, I also feel lucky to be here. You know, Harvard is, is such, a, such a great place where there's so many people you can contact to, to help Chile. So I'm really happy about it. develops a lesson for people around her to learn, to investigate the world a little bit. And she has them um, learn very simple things about the country, but within a much larger context. And that's kind of what we're trying to think about here. So, and it's not to say that we shouldn't learn about the food of these countries, definitely, but let's put it in a larger context, in a context where students are able to grapple with an issue in these places. So at your tables, we've looked at um, investigate the world and recognizing perspectives. So at your tables, consider a few moments in, your of moments in your life in which you came to understand another person's perspective or your own. What triggered such recognition? What did you come to understand? And then if there's time, how can you redesign instruction to nurture students' ability to recognize and, ex and express instructions? So let's take some time now. We'll do um, we'll do four minutes.
at your tables. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's wrap it up, please, at the tables. All right, thank you for sharing there. And again, you can take some of those ideas that you're listening to and sharing into your breakout sessions today. Um, our next global competence is uh, communicating ideas. Back on 102, it's the third column. And just trying to connect it a little bit um, to uh, the common core speaking and listening standards that you'll all be um, thinking about. So again, I'm doing this so that once you start with the global competencies, you don't stop when you start doing common core standard alignment at your school. So if, um, under speaking and listening, flexible communication and collaboration, this is a common core language. Um, st students must develop a range of broadly use useful oral communication and interpersonal skills. Uh, so these are, uh, and, and you, can, you can infer them, you can assume them in some of the global competencies as you develop your lessons. Uh, for writing, here's a common core example. To produce clear, coherent writing in which the development, organization, and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and audience. We've seen those words before, task, purpose, and audience. And the global competencies further develops these standards by adding nonverbal language and reflecting on how effective language, how effe effective language affects understanding in an interdependent world. And I know that was one of the words that we talked about at the beginning. So how does that, um, how effective communication uh, relates to understanding our role in an interdependent world? Uh, take action is the fourth competence, again on page 102. Uh, globally competent students translate their ideas and findings into appropriate actions to improve conditions. So that's right out of the GCs. The Common Core Standards places an emphasis on real world application, uh, applicability of knowledge and skills. In mathematic, mathematical practice standard four, focuses on modeling and notes that mathematically proficient students can apply the math they know to solve problems arising in everyday life, society, and the workplace. So those math teachers in here can start thinking about how, how to use um, global competencies and create lessons that, where they'd actually be solving problems around a global issue. So um, I wanna end with uh, another little video, and it's from the Stanford University School of Business um, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, this was, I don't know if people have seen this before, imagine it, the Post-it Project at all, but it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, it was a challenge to dozens of countries, hundreds of universities, and thousands of students. The, um, the directorship of the entrepreneurship school um, took an idea and went global with it, and they contacted all these universities. They took an everyday object and told these groups of students around the world to create value with it. Now, there's probably 18 different definitions of value it could be financial value, social value, entertainment value, um, emotional value, um, all, uh, uh, relationship value, all sorts of different types of value here. But this was a lot of fun. And um, they were given six days for the challenge. And they were told that they could only come up with, they, they had to present all of their information on, on their task and activity in a three minute presentation. Uh, so it was really, it was really quite interesting. So, the uh, everyday object that was given to them was the post-it, which are on your tables. You use them, you were using them with your books today. And the post-it itself kind of represents a symbolic of innovation. Uh, and uh, somebody created this idea that these little notes needed to stick without being, had tape, uh, adhesive tape put on it. So they, it was kind of a symbol of this. And really it tells you, um, and one, I, one of the, the ideas that I think that Brandon and I both wanted to get across to you is that global competencies can be integrated into curriculum with limited resources, although we want to give you as many resources as we can, and we'll give you websites, and, all, and, and you're going to be working with organizations this afternoon that will be able to give you resources to help you do so. But even with the most limited resources, students can take action. And um, what they did was they, take, they took the mundane and made it special. 
and they did it through teamwork, collaboration, and communication. And as one of the professors said, they were essentially given nothing. And it was a way to test their creativity and see it in practice with young people. So this is really kind of fascinating. First of all, I think the, the students did a great job identifying what they thought was an important issue. The first value created was the happiness. The responses were more than what we had expected. Disabilities are not at all obstacle. They also did an incredible job telling the story. I th we need to start Promote creative thinking. We should all do that. In Thailand, Ed Rubish, he knows. To promote creative thinking is, is to do something different. Um, and I think in the context that I'm used to working, which is in entrepreneurship, it, it usually means in the, in the context of not having resources. It doesn't have to be just a simple business transaction uh, in a country like Thailand and our neighboring countries like India and developing countries. I see an incredible amount of creativity in people just getting by in their normal lives. I think the goal of the students um, was to bring that awareness straight up in front of us and, uh, and that's what they did. We created a value added for a single post-it papers by asking for sponsorship from 3M company. As a first step to go straight to the 3M office in Thailand and say, um, we need more post-its, I thought that's a great innovative step. The objective of this mission was to stimulate awareness to the society, to pay more attention to disabled people. First of all, I think the, the students did a great job identifying what they thought was an important issue. The first value created was the happiness. The responses were more than what we had expected. Disabilities are not at all obstacle. They also did an incredible job telling the story. I think the, the fact that they sat down and, and kind of thought through exactly what they wanted their video to say was, was absolutely amazing. Empathy and help are not always what they want. They just want the equal opportunities as normal people, and they want their voices to be heard. Their execution was as amazing as, as their dream of what they wanted to accomplish. In the process of collecting responses, we encountered a problem of limited manpower. Therefore, we presented the project to our friends and got them to work with us. They were, they were showing the power of communication and the impact they can have just by, by taking some very simple tools and directing them in the right way. We went to Tha Prachan, Siam Square, and Khao San Road, and we got such a great support from the public. And I think that's what innovation is all about. It's not uh, having endless resources, it's the amount of impact you can have from a very small uh, amount of scarce resources. The reaction from the public was magnificent through this project. The friendship was created. Some of the people who wrote the messages on Wednesday returned as a volunteer on the next day. Thai newspaper reporter also came to the site and published our attempt nationwide. The tourists from around the world also contributed to this mission by writing the message on post-it. Even the messages were different in terms of form, contents, and languages, but what we felt in common was the word loves and care. From just a pack of post-it, we got 2,500 messages, 7,640 baht. But beyond those measurable value, we are also able to create awareness, friendship, and most of all, happiness to the society.
that was how a, one group of students um, decided to take action. So at this point, I'm going to um, conclude my conversation here and uh, thank you all for your attention um, and have Jamie come back up. Thank you.